welcome everyone to our second roundtable of the International Borlaug Dialogue, Investment Innovations for Food Systems Transformation. Since the onset of COVID-19, there has been unprecedented capital infusion mobilized globally for relief efforts, multi-billion and trillion dollar packages, aiding those most effective, trying to boost employment, prioritizing resources for medicine, but we haven't seen that investment for food systems. This roundtable is gonna look at the conditions and mechanisms most needed to fund the innovations we need to build resilient food systems. We're gonna explore all of them, a lot of them. I'm gonna introduce our speakers now, but you can see all of their biographies just below in your Whova screen. So we'll just do short introductions. First, Hillary Berry is here. She is founder, secretary general of Lady Agri Impact Investment Hub. Welcome, Hillary. Hi there. Beth Bechtel. Beth is the Deputy Director General at FAO, calling in from Rome. Welcome, Beth. Howard W. Buffett, Professor, Columbia University. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. Sarah Eckhouse is here. She's Executive Director of Food Shot Global. Sarah, thank you for joining us. The Honorable Ted McKinney. He's our Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs here in the US at the US Department of Agriculture. Hi, Ted. Dr. Pervi Mehta is calling in from India, head of Asia Agriculture for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Welcome, Pervi. Dr. Ismail Sarah Geldon, Emeritus Librarian of Alexandria, Egypt. Welcome. Thank you. Tony Santonas, Director of Scaling Positive Agriculture for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Tony? Thanks for having me. Of course. Akeem Steiner is the Administrator for the UN Development Program. Akeem, welcome. Hello, Barbara. And somehow in the course of this, I missed Jim Collins, our CEO from Corteva AgriScience. Hey, Barbara, great to be here. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're gonna start right into our first question and talk about how the mobilization of funds for food systems has shifted in these most recent disruptions that we've seen. And then what are some of the conditions and mechanisms that are needed to shift investment patterns and improve food systems, especially for our most marginalized communities? Akeem, can you get us started? Thank you, Barbara. Obviously, with such a distinguished panel, uh, a risky proposition to start off with. But I think, to me, the inspiring part of framing the discussion is food systems. And I think one of the perhaps biggest lessons we have been learning over decades is that when you look at food systems and you then narrow it down to food production, you're missing probably four-fifths of not only the value chain, but indeed of the drivers that influence food systems in terms of their ability to produce uh, to supply, but also to sustain farmers and the farming economy. And I want to make a big plea for trying to look at the issue of investing in food systems as really being one also of a farmer's economy, because farmers are ultimately custodians of the land, of the resources, of the ecological infrastructure, and ultimately, obviously, of the produce. And I think when you look at it from that point of view, then three or four things stand out. And very briefly, just to flag them, one, the distortions in our markets and economic policy systems, the $540 billion in subsidies every year. We all know that they are very often either not well targeted or the unintended consequences in terms of distortions actually create more problems. We need to revisit that. I think we also need to look very much at um, the, the economics of society valuing within the purchase of the product from a farmer that function which they play in maintaining what are often ecological infrastructure, landscapes, um, biodiversity. And so often we have reduced the um, cost or rather the price that society is willing to pay for a product from a farmer simply to the output that is measured in tons or in kilograms. And I think that has been one of the perhaps long-term corroding factors to a viable and sustainable farming economy. Thirdly, let us look at food waste and food loss. Why is there a global economy today that, according to our colleagues at the FAO, and I'm sure they will speak to that in a moment, 
loses through food waste and food loss more than one third of what is produced with all the effort, all the inputs and all the economic losses associated. Clearly, we need to do something here and very often has to do with the kind of investments that allow smallholder farmers to actually have a far greater opportunity to maintain their produce, be able to take it to market and a lot that follows from it. Um, we also need to look, go up in the production chain. I think the more we look at simply the farm in terms of an output and the market price that it fetches, the income, so um, so to speak, equation of a, of a farming household, be it a large farmer or a small farm for that matter, we miss out much of what makes actually a farming operation viable and ultimately also economically important. And I think here GDP is often distorting because the budgets of a finance ministry are often led by the contribution of a sector to the economy. The farming economy is vastly underrated, therefore vastly also underfunded in terms of investment by public budgets. And that needs to happen. Finally, a lot of this points precisely to the picture that is behind me, the sustainable development goals. They are central, not in terms of one goal, but in fact of all the 17 goals to the kind of investment propositions we're trying to make. Because an investment in a farmer, in food systems, immediately has multiple returns in other goals. And that is so often less lost in development planning, development finance and investment budgets. So these are just a few pointers perhaps to where we need to look for a way of reframing the economics of farming, but much more importantly, to embed the food system in our larger economic systems. And I think these are examples of where distortions and opportunities abound and we need to fix them. Thank you. Thank you so much. From the Gates Foundation perspective, and your investments, what are some of these uh, innovative mechanisms? Pervy? Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Barbara, and congratulations for taking this forward. Dr. Borlaug would be very proud that despite of whatever happened to the world, uh, we continue with this dialogue. So congratulations on that. I wanted to build on what Akim just said. I think this uh, this crisis, interestingly, it started perhaps as a, we, we thought of it as a short-term localized health crisis has evolved into a very, very long-term globalized economic crisis, right? And uh, the supply chain disruptions across the world has translated into some major food system challenges. And, um, uh, you know, when we look at the countries, about 85 countries so far have rolled out large food welfare programs. Uh, there are some very interesting common factors in those. Number one is because you mentioned Gates Foundation and donors, uh, you know, one of the very common factor is most countries have relied upon their fiscal reserves to respond to this crisis. The second very interesting commonality is, is that most countries, and to a great surprise, have, have gone to looking at uh, a long-term resilience and not just short-term response, which is, which is a very, very new thing this pandemic has brought. So build back uh, better uh, sentiment. South Asia, for example, uh, you know, which hosts two thirds of the half a billion people who are expected to uh, to be pushed into into poverty. Every single South Asian country, for example, has taken a long term resilience view and are changing policies and so forth. So there are some very very interesting commonalities that's coming up. In terms of innovation, there are two things that have become forerunner which again is a very unique feature. Uh, number one is very interestingly, uh, you know, the, the, the country's data and ICT infrastructure has been directly proportional to their ability to effectively respond. And therefore, the, the data, which was often seen as an unfelt need, especially by developing countries, has taken a very prominent stage. And therefore, how do we leverage upon that is, is very interesting. Second to Akim's point, very interestingly, the shift and attention from a very, very production-centric approach by countries to a very market-centric approach and looking at the economics and things like that. I think those are some of the very, very interesting things. And we, as, a, as a, a, an, an, an organization, we are focusing on some of these things to leverage upon to, and to, to be able to play that catalytic role. Uh, Two 
downsides of these commonalities that I mentioned, I think is worth investing. We're talking about number one is across all these countries that has rolled out food uh, um, programs uh, in 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 last uh, six seven months, uh, they are all based on maximum four commodities. And therefore, the whole diversification agenda, which also contributes significantly to the nutrition part of it, has some somewhat been ignored. And that's a very striking uh, thing. And my second point, which is also worrying, is... Uh, you know, in in while their countries have responded and all of that, there has been extremely limited amount of collective actions between the countries that we have seen. People have really, frankly, often responded very much in isolation. So very limited collective actions uh, within the between the countries and between the sectors. Agriculture has responded on its own. Health has responded on its own, and there has been very very limited uh, sort of those those type of cross leveraging that has happened, which has also brought in a lot of opportunity cost. So a lot of upside and commonalities, but at the same time, some very striking uh, common downsides as well. Thank you for those observations. Very, very telling observations for the, what's going on at this time. Beth, let's turn to you. Sure. Thanks very much. And uh, I think my comments will will follow nicely on the previous ones. I, I do want to start with a little bit, though, unfortunately, of some of the more sobering, I think, realities that uh, that Purvi was also referencing, which is that right now the global COVID-19 response has really sort of been framed around a, a few key axes. I mean, first, obviously, for most countries is just making sure that they can stabilize their own economy and their own budgets. Um, there's debt, rescru- re- de- debt rescheduling and relief, and there's aid to their own health sectors to basically mitigate the impacts of the virus itself and build pandemic preparedness. And then obviously humanitarian assistance and economic relief around that. And what we are actually seeing, and I would assume others in our same kind of multilateral system are seeing as well, is that development donors at least are having Barbara to prioritize their investments in health systems and in social safety nets, um, which are obviously critical to each of their national countries' strategy to combat the effects of COVID. And so as a result, funding to the health sector is increasing sharply um, as the most direct way to respond to the crisis. But some of this is starting to become redirected. And so just as an example, Germany announced its emergency COVID response program in April, about 3 billion euros. And in that, fresh funding of about 600 million euros will be made available for food security related assistance. So a clear direction being given by one of our largest EU donors around food assistance and food security. The UK, on the other hand, we are anticipating will likely cut by about 20% their development assistance budget, larger than we had expected based on their own national economic forecasts. And when they then have to reprioritize what's left, a national government has to sort of step back and kind of take the larger stage. And for the UK, they're likely going to be focusing on poverty reduction, climate change and reversing biodiversity loss, girls' education, and then their own national COVID-19 response. So again, a bit of a sobering reality of what really is available in global financing for these larger COVID uh, food systems responses. So the competition for funding uh, is increasingly fierce. It always has been um, between and among UN agencies and other NGOs and other organizations and groups that are out there all trying to elevate. um, We know that the resources right now are going to be increasingly challenged. But that said, the glass half full reason for optimism is that innovations, uh, investments in innovation have really taken off. And this is, I think, where we have a real opportunity to sort of reset the plane a a bit. Um, If you can look at innovations that are not only helping with containment measures and other restrictions that have been put in place, but are having real impact. So for example, the digitalization of transactions along the value chain, um, connecting consumers to markets, innovations in working conditions, 
innovations um, in the food and agricultural field, the use of the latest protective measures and equipment. All of these are just examples of innovations that came as a direct result of COVID, but because of support from IFIs, from the World Bank, from private sector partners, I think we're finding that innovation can really be one of those leading reasons uh, to, to bring more support um, and to find unique and maybe differentiated tools of financing and funding to continue to support the overall food system. Back over to you. Great, well, tremendous illumination of just exactly the proposition that we're facing and how do you build more of that innovative financing and what kinds of mechanisms? And I know so many of you have so much experience in this area. Anybody wanna to respond to this? Hillary, you're managing uh, an incredibly innovative new fund. We'll do, go to Hillary and then Ismail. Okay, um, thanks so much, Barbara. Um, yes, I think what Beth has highlighted as well is that, um, what, and what Pervy has spoken about, is that um, COVID has really shown these faults uh, in our supply systems. Um, I'm specifically looking, uh, Lady Agri specifically looking at women in the agri supply chains in Africa. So Africa didn't show as many numbers in terms of COVID compared to the rest of the world. But what it is showing is massive food insecurity because of the disrupted supply chains. Um, but looking at the glass half full, what it has done for our women entrepreneurs, because imports are down, it's actually created market opportunities for them. Um, and if we talk about agri-supply chains, if we don't talk about women, we're really um, missing out on those who are working hard from farm to fork, getting those food systems uh, up and running and getting uh, nutritious food to the local populations at this time. Thank you. Ismail and then Sarah, and then we'll move yeah, on. I, I think uh, that um, uh, everything, I agree with, with everything that's been said, but I would like to uh, bring a little bit of the uh, risk of an empty glass rather than, uh, than uh, the glass half full. And that is basically that we are being told very clearly by all the science that we are likely going towards a, a much higher level of uh, climate change in terms of global warming, with the likely effect that specifically in the in the in Africa, uh, North Africa and the Middle East is going to be uh, hotter, drier, and uh, less food secure than it has been in the past. Sub-Saharan Africa uh, will have much more erratic rainfall, with the result that. Uh, with 95% of the agriculture being non-irrigated, uh, you will have cycles of flood and drought. Now, this will require a much more resilient system and adaptation should start from now. And in fact, divergence of, of funds means that the idea of investing in protective uh, structures and other things, because five, 10 years from now, we, go, we expect to have some very serious problems, is not happening. And uh, the priorities, of course, of, of, of the health sector can be understood. But at the same time, uh, we know that every time you're going to have one of these uh, major climatic uh, effects, uh, you are likely to have huge shortages and you require humanitarian aid on a significant degree. And governments are relinquishing thinking about uh, greater resilience, buffer stocks and other things of that nature and specifically also how to assist farmers with more uh, adaptation, uh, not just in terms of talking of mitigation on the climate change side. That investment, I think, is not happening, and I'm hoping that we will be able to discuss ways of making it happen. Thank you. Sarah, quick comment. Uh, just quickly, I think, you know, what everyone has talked about in terms of some of the risks um, where money is being shifted maybe away from agriculture and towards health. I think this speaks to the need to think systemically about agriculture and how it connects to health and how it connects, you know, how can you possibly address poverty uh, without addressing, uh, you know, investing in agriculture? How can you possibly uh, address challenges related to biodiversity without looking at agriculture and agriculture's role in uh, deforestation and and the reduction in biodiversity around the world. 
So I think we just need to, uh, it, it just speaks to the need to position agriculture as a, a win-win solution in addressing all of these problems and investing in ag agriculture is, uh, you know, has all of these side benefits that maybe are being considered in, in some cases. Thank you for that point. And Sarah, maybe just say one word about Foodshot Global and the innovative mechanisms that you're putting forward through the program. Sure. Um, well, Foodshot Global is a collaborative investment platform, and we work uh, with uh, groups from around the world, from banks to universities to investment funds to foundations to catalyze innovation for a healthier, more sustainable, more equitable food system. And we kind of have framed these uh, food shots or moon shots for better food um, that we see as key leverage points to transform the food system. And, and the whole idea is that investing in these uh, issues, one the first of which was innovations in soil health, of course, which aligns very well with uh, Dr. Lal's work, um, will allow us to achieve goals in other areas. And so, you know, investing in soil isn't just about improving soil health, it's about improving human health and nutrient bioavailability. I think Dr. Lal said today that, um, you know, soil degradation is the cause of global malnutrition, you know, and so improving soil health is really critical to addressing issues of, of uh, nutrition. Uh, when you look at farmer profitability, that's a, a key in poverty. Soil health is critical to that. And then also, of course, uh, ecosystem restoration, climate change mitigation and resiliency. Uh, soil health is key to that. So it's really identifying these key challenges that are also opportunities um, and using investment uh, capital and also philanthropic capital through a prize to create a transformative uh, change. Great, thank you, thank you so much. So let's shift and uh, talk a little bit about uh, a, a, a different component of all this. Uh, we have a wonderful media partner with us, Farming First, and they were able to poll our audience in advance about questions that they'd really like to hear from our speakers. And this, this set of topics really came up through, uh, through those questions submitted by you, by our audience. Just as Pervy was talking about how long-term response is elevated and people are, countries especially, looking out a bit further to try to figure out how to build back better, we need to also be thinking about how to increase our investment now for long-term research efforts and high-impact long-term solutions. So what are some of those um, proven technologies, proven uh, uh, impacts for these long-term solutions. And I'm gonna first go to you, Jim. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Barbara. And you're right, this is the, the world that uh, the, at Corteva that I live in um, every day is thinking about the investments that the previous uh, panelists were talking about um, because those investments, that investment in technology is absolutely the source of addressing uh, these these challenges uh, going forward, and that's what Corteva was kind of found on. Since since our uh, uh, emergence from the Dow Dupont uh, merger, uh, we've got 14 brand new innovation, game changing things that we've launched into the marketplace. So, um, but we don't stop there, right? You your question is, are, are you looking far enough forward and and bringing those uh, bringing those uh, types of ideas? So, um, I think about them in three areas. Uh, one we're really excited about is around um, gene editing and uh, with tools known as CRISPR. And congratulations to our uh, uh, the, the Nobel uh, Prize winners for for the acknowledgement of, uh, of of this incredible tool. Um, a great example of that is where we're working with U.S. Department of Agriculture. We're working with the Kenyan um, Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization. We've partnered with Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, and we're uh, and Simit, and we're applying that tool to solve one of the worst diseases in corn in in Africa, the uh, uh, maize uh, lethal necrosis. Um, and what CRISPR does is allows us to make very specific changes, very precisely, but we can do it fast. And, and that's the importance here is speed. I think as the panelists, other panelists recognize that we're not moving fast enough. Uh, and if you see a crisis like uh, the pandemic and how quickly it can disrupt many of our food food systems. So speed will be important. 
Another area that we're really excited about is, is investments in environmentally friendly crop solutions. I, I think um, uh, as, um, um, as uh, Sarah was mentioning, that uh, we have the opportunity to not only um, have agriculture play a role here in solving food security issues, but also in solving some of these climate um, issues that Ishmael was also um, mentioning. So um, things like uh, changing uh, rice cropping systems and eliminating uh, the need for rice paddies and eliminating methane gas that, that comes off of, of many of these rice production systems. It's a huge greenhouse gas that we can we can reduce with uh, with newer technology, and then uh, the third area I would mention, and it's already been mentioned, is is how important digital uh, and data uh, is. And we've been expanding our software solutions uh, for customers and making you know those solutions readily available you know to to you know, millions of farmers um, all all around the world uh, to really put that powerful information uh, in in their hands. So. Kind of at the core of it, we're thinking much more now about circular or closed loop farming systems where technology can play a, a role. And the idea is simple. Let's keep more resources and materials that are on that farm in use on the farm as long as possible uh, and to produce more outputs with less uh, inputs. And um, farmers are already experts at uh, reusing uh, resources and reducing waste uh, and so we're uh, we're going to announce uh, partnerships with folks like Microsoft, where we're exploring new technologies and tools that that can give farmers that needed information so they can know where they can get more uh, with uh, with less. So um, I, I'm really excited about carbon sequestration technologies and, and the use of uh, AI and cloud computing and some of the uh, Internet capabilities out there to really transform uh, these uh, these systems. So we position Corteva uh, to be an enabler of what I think are going to be some tectonic shifts from from technology, and you'll be hearing about a lot more of those efforts in the weeks and months to come. Barbara, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you for those examples. Ismail, long-term research interest. This is such an area of interest for you. What are some of those Important. Indeed. Well, uh, first, I'd like to uh, say uh, how much I agree with what Jim has said. Uh, that what the new technology, the new science, the new science enables us to do much more quickly uh, uh, what we want to address. So it took us, for example, 15 years in conventional breeding to get the quality protein maize. Uh, we can now do this in two years, three years maybe. Uh, and uh, what we need is to start thinking both in terms of a leapfrogging effect that will bring about uh, the kinds of plants that we need uh, and uh, also uh, reduce things. So for example, we want um, upland rice that is, uh, or all, not just rice, but uh, all plants that would be more uh, uh, salt resistant, more drought resistant, uh, have deeper roots, shorter growing season, uh, more nutrition, uh, higher yield, and we can have it all. I mean, that's the amazing thing we can. And when you add that to systems thinking, which we need better management systems, we've seen that in, in actually the systems of rice intensification, work that has been done very effectively. Plus we want greater storability, greater transportability, because a huge part of the population increase is going to be in cities and in many of the poor, poorest countries in the world. The infrastructure for roads is very poor and the ability to move that. And we have a loss of about 35% in many of the crops uh, after uh, harvest. So uh, we need uh, delayed senescence we need, and all of that can be done. The problem is to move from lab to farm quickly and to move from farm to, to consumer and to think in terms of an integrated system that brings greater efficiency in terms of uh, per unit of land, per unit of water, per unit of energy, and per unit of labor, as well as the maintenance of the environment in the cases that we've talked about before. So this is a science program that requires collaboration, and we've had instruments like the CGIR, like other international organizations that pulls together scientists and the scientists are willing to work together, but we have to get it adapted to the local uh, requirements of each country and to get it to the farmers. That was 
Norm Borlaug's last words, get it to the farmers, get it to the farmers. Norm, we listen to you. <laughs> We're getting there. We're all trying to get there. Thank yeah. you so much. Tony, from BC WBCSD perspective. Yeah, I mean, you know, from our side then, um, we've heard a lot from the other speakers on this, this critical role of uh, new market innovations and technologies. I'm, I'm really pleased that that's come up from both um, representatives in the United Nations, but also the private sector. Uh, the role of digital advisory services, just as one example, has been a critical enabler to keep farms running during the COVID crisis. And this is a socially distanced tool that we have at our fingertips. Not all farmers, sadly, have it at their fingertips yet. So we need to make sure that we take those public-private partnerships approaches um, to getting them out into the field where they're needed. Um, of course, the, the winner of the food prize this year uh, dedicated his life to the role of soil health. Um, and I think just within that space, then we know that that's a key way to support agricultural transformation that's climate, nature, and farmer positive. Um, but we're gonna need clear standards, um, ways to map data, clear markets, providing a, a proper carbon price, if that's gonna work, that's actually going to incentivize that flow of finance that's, that's needed into the system. Um, and so ultimately, to get to real scale, this, this investment is, is, is the key enabler. And a lot of discussion is happening now around what those game-changing initiatives are that are going to help multiple actors um, invest properly into this space in albeit difficult times. One of the areas we know is key here is this food systems transformation piece about understanding how we can effectively bring the different constituents to get together, the actors of public and private, but also many of our different groups. We've got groups of us who work with farmers, groups of us who work with sustainability and business, and we'll speak quite different languages. Um, but ultimately, we have to make sure that there is a just transition in all of this work that's going to benefit landowners and smallholder farmers and all types of farmers alike. Um, we know that those investments need to therefore meet a just rural transition, if you like. And investors have huge interest in this topic. Um, we're doing a lot of work to bring investors together as part of an investor partnership network to make that happen. Um, but they'll need the knowledge, they'll need the standards to understand what metrics they need to put in place um, to incentivize this. And they'll also need to be acting regionally into the big projects, the big regional country level projects that are going to make a difference. Uh, we've heard a bit on rice, um, work such as the Sustainable Rice Landscapes Initiative. That's another initiative which is trying to mobilize public and private finance towards around nine country projects across South and Southeast Asia. That's doing work with farmers on farm, landscape restoration, bringing in the value chain to pull sustainable rice, get it into the consumer's um, hands as well. So there's a lot of change and partnerships that need to come from all of this, Barbara. Thank you, Tony. Just say, say a little bit more about a just rural transition and the partnership really that, and the investment that's happening there. Well, I mean, a lot of this came around because we realize in the strong movement of the environmental food systems transformation space, you know, we've heard about um, soil carbon, for example, this is this has come up time and time again, and the, the markets for soil carbon. Um, but around the world, we've also seen that there has to be an equitable role um, for farmers and landowners um, in terms of how those changes take place. So in other words, if we want to shift the food system towards a more sustainable future, what can we do to effectively invest into the types of jobs that are needed to get farmers there? We've seen this in the um, energy environment and in the Green New Deal. Um, and what we're seeing now is investors um, across the world integrating just transition metrics into their projects so that this can actually happen. A lot of this has happened in the past with public money. 
um, from the likes in particular of, for example, the UK government and the uh, FCDO there, previously DFID, have done a lot of work to invest. But we want to see this at a greater scale. And these types of metrics and standards that are being used by the public sector need to be adopted by the private sector as well, if we're going to get to this just transition uh, for the rural masses out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Others to respond on this. Howard. Barbara, thank you. I really um, I wanted to build on Tony's comments because I think there was a couple of uh, parts that are very important to pull out. First is, um, Barbara, you really opened up this panel uh, talking about how we get to innovative, impactful solutions. Uh, and I think just as much as a, a research and technology challenge, this is also an issue around information asymmetry. So Tony's point about better need for data and having the right metrics and to help that increase the flow of finance, I think is spot on. And so as we think about companies or foundations or development agencies and their work, and they're all out trying to improve the world, of course, um, there are some common questions I hear from these organizations over and over. First is, how do we know if our programs are high impact? And then second, what data goes into our analysis to support our evidence base? And I think addressing these challenges really centers around three questions. First is, what are the metrics that organizations are using? Uh, nearly anything can be measured, so we have to make sure we're measuring the things that matter the most. Two, what data do organizations actually have access to in order to support their case? And this is where a lot of groups I work with struggle because getting the data is either too costly or time consuming or it's just complex to do for whatever reason. Uh, and then third, how do organizations analyze the information and then in use that to inform their actions and report out correctly? So I would argue that we absolutely need new technology solutions uh, and that could include improved data standardization and measures uh, better options uh, for analysis uh, and, and so on. And hopefully this is something we can talk more about in the next part of the Q&A, because I think that uh, it'll help drive, uh, as Tony was saying, that the capital that's needed in order to bring about a lot of the uh, solutions that the other panelists are talking about. Great, thank you so much. Sarah, did you have any thoughts you wanted to offer on this? Just more on the mechanisms? Okay, great. Others, let's open it up. Anybody else? Hervey. So Barbara, just a quick comment on what Jim and Ismail and Tony all three said uh, on the, uh, and Howard said about that as well, the information asymmetry and the need for innovation in technologies. I think we must realize as a world that one of the biggest asymmetry lies in the post-harvest part of the food value chain, uh, the connections to the market. We know so much more, I'm not saying enough, but we know so much more about the pre-harvest part in the production and most of the innovations are uh, have been focused towards that. Uh, farmers farm because they're interested in markets. Farmers don't farm just because they're interested in higher production. And therefore, any of these innovations we talk about, I think, you know, the second part of the, of the food supply chain needs so much more attention from the world. Others? Yes. All right. May I come in? Or after I just spoke? Ismail, then Akeem. Uh, okay, very quickly, I just wanted to add that uh, uh, one of the best uh, tools to get uh, uh, new technologies to uh, poor farmers is the seed. So if uh, you are in fact transforming the seed and uh, it's a technology that is not dependent on scale of uh, land holding like mechanization or anything like that, it's, it goes very directly. Transformations of that must include uh, really the, the uh, food content. The nutritional content can be increased dramatically. And I think we've discovered that sometimes we run into obstacles such as uh, vitamin A rice, for example, that has been uh, having difficulty in being marketed. But most of the time, uh, these uh, things like quality protein maize, uh, a former World Food Prize winner uh, as well, uh, we, we have a technique here where it's not just the amount of production, but it's the quality of production. And that is very important for the nutrition of, of the children and the mothers and uh, and uh, all the poor people, because we know that chronic malnutrition uh, is not is partially about about quantity, but also about quality. Akim, 
Thank you. If I may for a moment take <clears throat> your decision for this year's winner of the World Food Prize, uh, Dr. Ratan Lal, soil fertility. If there's one thing that determines whether we can produce, it is really the soils. And, and as Beth will confirm, for a number of years now, the way that we are producing and intensifying food production, agricultural production, is actually resulting in a net loss of arable land. And this is an equation that it doesn't take much imagination to realize is going to lead us into um, an ever more intense problem. So I think around the whole notion of soil fertility lies a key area. The second point I would plead for is who are the users that we're actually conducting R&D for? There is a very strong tendency because of the global R&D um, economy of um, ever greater economies of scale and the corporate dimension of it. And I don't know if Jim would agree or disagree with me. We need to find a way of balancing the intensification of agriculture through R&D that serves a certain agricultural um, market economy model, but actually leaves out the backbone of food production in the world, which is smallhold farmers, or puts them into a very difficult economic or very constrained economic space. And um, I would argue that we need to learn to work more with nature rather than try and replace nature in the food production process, which has really been, to some extent, the paradigm driving the frontiers of research over the last uh, 50 to 100 years. What do I mean by that? Well, Ismail spoke already to adaptation, climate change. We need to figure out how on earth are we going to create greater resilience in food systems. But it's also perhaps going back to something that has been remarkable in its absence. Why are we not looking more at, for instance, perennial food crops. They have completely disappeared, except with a few pockets, from the research agenda. Much of the genetic um, material on which we draw and, and also where food comes from is actually from perennial food crops. And yet agriculture is increasingly premised on turning everything upside down once a year, twice a year, three times a year. And finally, on technology, I don't want to in any way argue that we need to go back in, in R&D. On the contrary, uh, 21st century frontiers, extremely important, digital and others. But I think it is for whom we conduct research with what paradigm we work with that material, that capital of soil, and how we drive also frontiers in terms of agriculture intensification. On all three fronts, there has been a lot that has gone wrong. And it is in part an explanation of where we find ourselves in today's food systems and agricultural production systems. Thank you. Yes, Sarah. I just really like to kind of uh, echo what Akeem said, and especially today is uh, in Indigenous Peoples Day. And so, you know, I think there are things that we can learn from, you know, generations and uh, before us um, in how to manage land, much like in California, um, the, the management of the forests, you know, went from being managed uh, by Indigenous peoples who did controlled burns, and then it, it as it transitioned to kind of a more commercial management, it we now have these massive fires that are uh, incredibly destructive. There are things that we we can learn, and we really do need to think about who is this for, and and equity, in addition to kind of the uh, sustainability and 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 regenerative aspects of of the environment and improving nutrition. Who who is benefiting in terms of, and this goes back to poverty as well, poverty reduction. Uh, and, and uh, also the empowerment of, of women and girls um, in, in agriculture. So I just really appreciate what Akeem said, and I think it's especially relevant um, on Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you. Thank you. Beth, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, I would just uh, say that, you know, again, on this area, I again feel a little optimistic that there is a bit of a, a turning tide, it seems, than maybe where we have been in perhaps the last maybe 10 or 20 years with a very polarized, I think, sort of reality in agriculture of just, I mean, we can say it, it was biotechnology and GMOs versus agroecology. And we got stuck in that. FAO got stuck in that. Our members got stuck in that. Private sector 
sector and, um, you know, and sustainable agriculture interests got stuck in that. And I don't sense that we're at that place any longer. As we put the Food Systems Summit together, as Barbara, you have a panel like this one bringing so many different perspectives and opinions and backgrounds and skill sets together. I, I again have reason, I think, for optimism to think that we are all beginning to think about this in a much more systemic way than in a one size fits all way that perhaps we had previously um, around technology. Uh, I think the private sector, um, you know, I even have here inside my own, you know, hallways at FAO colleagues that oftentimes I feel like I have to sort of introduce them for the first time to people like Jim Collins, um, to the kind of work that Corteva does. Um, to the shared mission that a company like Corteva might actually have, that they actually know what the sustainable development goals are and they hold themselves equally accountable to that. Um, that was not a culture that frankly existed um, in an organization like ours in the not too distant past. And I think that is shifting and is another reason for us to, to stay positive and connected with each other on these bigger conversations. Uh, I will. We certainly hope we are in the midst of a paradigm shift and the kind of cooperation and mutual support for different kinds of work going on at all levels continues. And we'll be taking that up throughout the week. Uh, let's shift our conversation just a bit to talk more specifically about some of these innovative, truly innovative and uh, newly forming uh, financial investment mechanisms that are coming to the fore. Uh, I want to turn first to you, Ted, to talk a little bit about diversification of the finance and investment. What's going on at USDA and how are you, uh, how is your agency and the Foreign Agricultural Service in uh, investing in all of this? Well, sure, Barbara. And uh, it's great to see everybody. Boy, far be it from me to try to instruct how financing of new technologies around the world should go when we've got an august panel like this. But I'll make some comments here. The, uh, the first thing is, yes, we must recognize today is National Indigenous Persons Day in the U.S. It's also a National Farmers Day. And a great deal of what gets me up every morning is to lift up farmers, not only like my dad and brother and that which I grew up with, but farmers around the world. And I've been on many, many, many of those farms. And so today I celebrate uh, National Farmers Day. And I also have to do a big, big congratulations to uh, our World Food Prize recipient, Dr. Lau. I was just in Northwest Ohio, where you have done so much work on trying to protect uh, Lake Erie and the Great Lakes, as did I when I was in the Department of Ag. And all is going well. Uh, attention to this, good technologies and perseverance is making a difference. And so my congratulations uh, uh, to you. Um, Barbara, just two or three things. Uh, uh, First of all, I, I wanted to take on and, and talk a little bit about what I think uh, uh, Akeem said. Uh, Akeem, I think you were suggesting that we have to be careful where we go, and I think I agree with that, but if, if that was uh, in any way hinting we should stay away from industry, I just have to call that out and say I think that is exactly the wrong step. I come from the corporate world. I cannot tell you how many times I, and I had a lot of the the societal responsibilities for those companies wanted to, attempted to reach out to parts of the world, offer technologies for free, try them out, see how they might work. And not rejected because the country didn't want to, but rejected because the country was afraid that some seed might get in the ground, be exported to certain regions of the world, and then they would be cut off. And this is a very real problem. Uh, I was with my very good friend, Jim Morris, and congratulations to the World Food Program, Nobel Prize winner, my gosh, Nobel Peace Prize, no less. Jim told me the story about being in a port as head of the World Food Program. A load of corn was being unloaded. Uh, women were there to gather that corn to go cook the food. And uh, the president of the country said, Jim, can you guarantee that this is non-GMO corn? And Jim said, well, we ordered that, we identity preserved it, but if you're asking if I can guarantee that every kernel is non-GMO, I cannot. And the load was promptly reloaded and sent back. And that wasn't because he was concerned about health for his citizens, as Jim described. It was because there was a concern that some seed might get planted, find its way specifically to Europe, 
and they would be cut off from exporting. Now that I think is also wrong. A couple of things. I believe that finance and investment has got to come from all sources and many of them are here on the screen and in the program today. My goodness, some of the greatest innovations have come from farmers themselves. Now they may not have the money to scale it up, but if they work with companies like Corteva or angel funds or investment funds, many of them on the screen here today, wow, the opportunities are fantastic. And I have seen that on our own farm. As a boy, I remember seed trials, hybrid seed trials on our farm. It quite happened just by chance to be with uh, Jim, your Corteva Pioneer brand. And that helped our family tremendously. And I know that such practices are helping the world in many different ways when they're allowed to. So all this talk about finance and investment is great, but if you're not allowed to apply the finance and investment to new technologies, yes, they must be proven as safe. No doubt about that. But they have been, and I think we know that. And if they're not, there's plenty of time to make sure that the regulatory systems around the world, Codex being one of them, makes sure that they're safe. So we in the U.S. are very, very proud of our contributions to the World Food Program, uh, to all these kinds of investments, but we are working, we're doubling down, particularly focused on Africa, who have come to us and said, look, we would like to be trying some of these. We have not been allowed to. I can't tell you how many discussions I've had with representatives of the African Union that want to try but in many ways are deterred or denied, or there's a myth among their members that some of these things are bad, and we must let that happen. I happen to believe that small, medium, and, sm and large-sized companies are a terrific source of innovation. Certainly governments like ourselves, my good friend Scott Hutchins is doubling down on our ag research service, dialing that in on the needs of people uh, the same goes for all of those funds like all of you have. Such terrific work, and it's an all-of-the-above strategy. But my goodness, we must allow for and accept certain amounts of risk. If we don't, who are we? We have done it for decades. And I, too, am a fan of Dr. Norman Borlaug. I knew Norm, certainly know his granddaughter, Julie, who's probably listening in. And boy, if there's one that he taught me, it is take it to the farmer. They are the world's first environmentalists. Take it to the farmer. Ismail, you said that as well. I've said it many times. There will be risks, people. There will be risks. But we have to allow some of that, provided that some of the base work is done. And only then, only then will we progress. So my friend Beth, I hope you're right that we really are coming together. I frankly am a little worried this farm to fork initiative out of the EU is very, very troubling. For the first time, we're seeing an entire continent say, reject technologies, all which have been proven as safe. So we'll be working with them. Much of the farm to fork I like a lot. Those are things we've practiced on our farm and many around the world have practiced. I'll be the biggest cheerleader on some of those. But when it comes to banning I think that is very wrong headed. I think it's contrary to all that we're talking about here. Technologies, I think, can be discovered by the financial community. Let's let them fund them and let's go try it out. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Ted. You're certainly provoking us with some good, some good challenges there. Uh, we appreciate it and others are gonna have a chance to respond. Howard, let's go to you. Talking about some of the uh, venture capital and other kinds of social impact investment strategies. You have so much, you've written so much and you have so much experience. <laughs> well, Barbara, thank you. First, I, I wholly regret coming right after Ted. Uh, I'm not nearly <laughs> as eloquent as he is, so hopefully everyone can forgive that. Uh, so Barbara, in this question, um, and I know what you've been thinking a lot about is around funding mechanisms. And you've talked about how, you know, we're seeing a massive amount of funding flowing right now. And so really the, the challenge to solving a lot of these issues uh, that we're facing isn't the lack of funding, it's getting it to the right place. And so I just wanted to take a different perspective, I think, in these remarks and talk about some of the missing ingredients uh, that are there. And I think one is really the ability to effectively understand the results that socially oriented or, or socially focused financing is trying to bring about in the world. So in a lot of these investments, a lot of the projects, a lot of the things that organizations represented on this panel are working on, how do we know when they're working? Uh, so first of all, uh, we all know, I'm sure here, that there's a you know some three to seven trillion dollar funding gap 
of investments that's needed per year to achieve the sustainable development goals. Akeem was speaking to this very specifically, and I'm sure he can, he can add to that. But one primary reason for this is market failures in those capital flows. Now, on one hand, this is probably not unsurprising because we're facing economic turmoil, we've got a global pandemic and a lot of other things going on. But on the other hand, these uh, capital failures are, uh, are, are, I would argue, somewhat surprising because we have ongoing signaling among US and European capital markets and investors uh, globally, really, who wish to combine social and financial returns when they're making their investments. And so one question is, is why is there this supply demand gap? And our research uh, at Columbia has really found three key impediments. So the first is that investors need to have a better understanding of the form, function, risk, and the utility associated with socially oriented financing vehicles. So these could be social impact bonds, they could be first loss capital tools, hybrid grants, uh, or some other type of blended finance mechanism. Uh, two, social entrepreneurs need better tools and training to access additional funding opportunities. So for a minute, picture an entrepreneur somewhere in the world. Uh, she wants to improve her community's access to food, uh, take her cottage industry and expand it out. Uh, well, think about how well equipped is she to access the capital she would need to do that. You know, for most parts of the world and under most circumstances, you could probably argue very poorly equipped. Uh, there's just not a lot of opportunities for someone like her to get the capital that she would need. And then the third problem uh, is the one we spoke about earlier, uh, information asymmetry. And really that's between investors who will prioritize social returns with their investments, and then project managers or social entrepreneurs, like I was mentioning, uh, who really struggle to provide adequate uh, measurable social performance results to those capital allocators. Uh, and I'm gonna spend 60 more seconds on this because I think it's really critical. So something I've been working on for a few years now is to really try to address this issue of information asymmetry. Uh, and so I have an approach, it's called impact rate of return, and it's designed to help organizations, regardless of their size or type, to be able to measure, analyze, and report on impact of any kind, and to do so in a way that's uniform and rigorous. And to do this, organizations really have to look across a number of key attributes of impact. One is the type of impact they're trying to deliver, so how, how is change being delivered? Two is the quantity of impact, so what's the magnitude of change that they're bringing about? Three is the qual uh, quality of impact, so how meaningful is that change? The fourth is the cost of impact, so how cost-effective is a given investment or a grant at bringing about change? And then uh, the fifth and final one is the time of impact, so how long does it take to deliver the intended change that these organizations or investors really want to bring about? And I would argue that organizations have to analyze all five of these attributes to get a comprehensive perspective. And the goal here, uh, with impact rate of return at least, is that anybody, whether they're a student who's graduating and launching a social enterprise, uh, or the head of a small NGO, or an investment professional at a pension fund, that anyone can engage uh, in this type of rigorous evaluation and provide the kind of impact reporting that investors and grant makers, and I would argue potentially even shareholders at this point, are coming to expect. Uh, and all without that being too onerous, uh, because I think that's what it's going to take to help address this really big gap in the marketplace. Uh, that's needed. So I'm, I'm happy to discuss more of this in the Q&A, but uh, as you can tell, I get a little excited about it because I think it's, it's really something that's needed. Well, I appreciate you bringing it so uh, clearly to the fore because I know you've written about it. In fact, in the resource section, I think we have uh, one of your articles, maybe a couple of them. So uh, we're going to let others uh, respond and ask questions about the impact rate of return formulation. Sarah, before I go to you, I want to I want to go to you, Hillary, because I know that these kinds of tools and the access to capital, particularly for women, particularly from women in Africa, this is the heart of your work. Absolutely, Barbara. And um, thank you for letting me follow Howard, because I think uh, it gets us right down to the issue about understanding um, how can we create more equity. Uh, in terms of access to capital. And when we talk about, again, when I mentioned earlier, we talk about agri-food systems. Um, we can't ignore the fact that uh, women are there from, I won't say farm to fork, because it makes a relationship to the policy uh, um, mentioned by Ted McKinney earlier on, but really looking at those distribution systems and seeing how we can actually get food um, to, the, to the markets. That means we need to be also gender smart about our investment. Um, and what Lady Agri has done is that we've taken on uh, 
almost the, the Goliath David and Goliath task as such, which is linking the investment uh, community. So right from development banks, right through to the commercial banks, um, so that they start looking at women as a clientele um, and women agri-entrepreneurs as a clientele. Um, because what we've seen for so long is that as such, they clientele that have been ignored. Uh, they run up against the issues of collateral when they want to have access to, to, to financing. And that is something very systemic. Uh, and culturally present in a number of countries, just for the fact that land is not in women's names. So what we're trying to do is actually get the banks to look at the businesses and how profitable those businesses can be. And on the other side, we work, um, as Howard just mentioned, in really equipping and building up the capacity of those women-led um, SMEs so that they can speak the language of banks so that they can be confident in actually going in, presenting their business case, um, speaking out, saying that they have a number of contracts with off-takers and getting the bank to take a closer look at their business, as opposed to just stopping and saying, we can't give you a loan because you don't have the traditional uh, collateral. Um, I'll give you a very clear case study. We work with different uh, clusters of women-led SMEs across Africa. This morning I was speaking with our cluster in Blantyre in Malawi um, and they came up with the issue, Hillary, we're looking for a loan at the moment, two-year loan that we can actually buy processing equipment. They're working in the sweet potato supply chain. There are a thousand women producers behind them. They have serious contracts with uh, formal supermarkets. However, because they don't have the traditional land ownership or because the bank will not take equipment as a guarantee, they can't access a $50,000 loan. And this is what is needed in terms of access to patient capital to develop agribusiness systems. Often when we talk about women in finance, women are relegated to the microfinance category. It is impossible to grow an agribusiness on the interest rates that are practiced by the microfinance community. And that's not a criticism. It's just a mismatch between the needs and uh, to actually develop the businesses and the financial projects are there. So Lady Agri is about holistic investment, equipping the women in terms of technical assistance. It's about access to appropriate agribusiness financial products. And thirdly, and I think that's very important in our discussions today, it's access to the equipment and technology right through to packaging to get a quality product to market. That's how you can inspire confidence in the finance system to invest, also in off-takers who will order on a regular basis from you. And this creates a rising tide because these women entrepreneurs are sourcing from women farmers. So Lady Agri is all about gender smart investment in building these sustainable food systems. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you for that great example. Sarah, I wanna to go to you for uh, any comments that you have, and then we're gonna open it up for just a few minutes for folks to comment uh, on uh, each other a little bit and some of the various uh, uh, great comments that we've heard. Sarah? Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I mentioned a little bit about Food Shock Global earlier and, and the integrated platform that we have with uh, philanthropic capital through our half million dollar plus groundbreaker prize, and then, uh, investment capital through our equity partners. Um, and I'll just kind of, I think, in response partly to what some of the other people say, mention why we've structured ourselves some um, in that way. One is that we want to move things more quickly, like Ismail said, from the lab to the farm, to the consumer. And um, you need that philanthropic capital often to, uh, get things started out of the lab when, before there is, when the, it's early stage research and it's higher risk and higher reward that might not be quite ready for an equity investment, but you can jumpstart it with some uh, prize capital, a grant. And then because we have this, this partnership of, of different equity partners, then provide the type of investment that can help it get to actually the market and into the hands of farmers. Um, 
And, and also I, I would just mention, we're being driven by the science and all of this. And so um, I think what Undersecretary McKinney said is really critical. We, we cannot be afraid of new technologies. Um, I think the work, uh, what uh, Jim Collins talked about in terms of CRISPR and the digitization, these are really critical tools. Um, and, and it's an all of the above. I think this was also mentioned, you know, we, we need an all of the above strategy. We need all hands on deck. We need one of the reasons we're structured as a collaborative partnership is that we don't think that any one, you know, philanthropy, foundation, bank, university, uh, investment fund alone can uh, achieve what the, the kind of transformation that is needed. And so that's the opportunity that uh, having a collaborative structure creates is you can, you know, not only provide the seed stage, the very early stage investment, the later stage investment, but even supply chain connections so that you can provide market access and product validation. Um, and, and then the other thing is on the patient capital side, you know, one of our hopes also is that these are long-term commitments. You know, when we identified soil health as our first uh, uh, food shot, we're, we're not letting it go. We've identified another food shot this year, which is uh, precision protein and really looking at, at protein in a more rigorous and scientific way. But we're continuing our investment in soil health. And so it's identifying those, um, you know, long-term uh, meaningful solutions. So um, that just brings together a little bit of what I heard from other people. And, um, you know, I think is, is something that I think we, we need more of that type of collaboration and long-term view um, to, to achieve real change. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Others want to reflect on what you're discussing so far? Quickly. Sure, Tony, go ahead. I just uh, wanted to build upon all of the, the investment examples um, that have come up. I mean, uh, again, looking at, we've heard from the social side, uh, we've heard from the environmental side, just one classic example with the banks that we're working with, working with a lot of the agricultural banks who are lending into um, farmers and agribusinesses around the world. Um, there isn't currently the means in the banking portfolio um, to know how much carbon you hold in your banking portfolio. And if you don't know that, then you don't have the tools at your disposal to know how to incentivize that shift. And so we're now working with some of those big agricultural lending banks, the likes of uh, Rabobank and BNP Paribas, but we want to include many others um, to create the types of tools that are needed to make this happen. Because ultimately, if you can get these types of requirements, it doesn't have to just be on greenhouse gas emissions. It can, of course, all be these social requirements that we're talking about. But if you can get those underwritten and put into the loan books of these banks and integrated in that way, then you have the means to really address the system from that perspective, from the investment, from the finance side. So we really find that as an important innovation that needs to be brought in. And we hope that many other finance players in this space can, can come on board to think about these sorts of issues. Isn't it incredible to hear how much is really going on? We, we understand that the technology has to move so quickly, that it is moving so quickly, and to bring the science to the fore, that just in, uh, transitions are going to be crucial in mobilizing our rural communities, that new technologies ha must be embraced, and the kinds of tools, such as impact uh, return on investment, to analyze where the investments, uh, the risky investments might be best uh, directed and collaboration, uh, the, the level of collaboration and partnerships that are going on in all directions and all around the world uh, are really striking. Uh, er early investment and patient, uh, finding that patient capital, these are all things that we know are necessary. And what do we hear, gosh, from almost everyone? You have to bring it all. You have to do it all. And uh, really, all of the above is the proposition of a safe, f affordable, nutritious, sustainable food system. And 
that's what's going forward. So uh, with all of that, we have, uh, we have great questions coming in from the audience. Uh, I want you to know that we're recording all those questions. We're gonna return them back to all of you all as our speakers. And also they're gonna stay live on Whova, so you can come back and, and take a look at them yourselves as well as speakers. So thank you for all that. This group wanted to do a lightning round of closing comments. So we're gonna give each person just one quick minute for a final comment. Jim, can we start with you? Great. I had to find the uh, find the mute button. Um, uh, look, I just appreciate uh, the, the the dialogue. I, I think uh, both uh, Ted and and Beth um, uh, raised some really really good comments. You know, from a partnering perspective, the opportunity to collaborate, um, and and have and gain and just having access. So um, we we work hard on from from an industry side, but um, I'll, I'll second Beth's comment. I, I have seen. A, a huge shift in the willingness and openness now um, with FAO, with USAID, other, others of inviting industry in to be part of these uh, solutions. And, and um, as Ted says, he's exactly right. There's no more willing partner that wants to be out involved, especially in rural communities with small older growers, helping them continue to, to, to dramatically uh, improve the resiliency of these of the food systems that are out there. And I believe in my heart that technology will be absolutely at the, at the core uh, of that. And we have some amazing tools right now today uh, that could be deployed to, to change this trajectory. We've just got to have, we've just got to have an open uh, shot at it and we'll show you what, uh, what we can do. So anyway, thank you so much, uh, Barbara, for the opportunity to participate with the group. Thank you, Jim. Hervey? Yeah, thanks. I'll pick it up from Jim and again reiterate uh, the, the need for collaboration that a lot of speakers have said. I like the way um, uh, Beth talked about, uh, you know, the, the culture change and all that. One thing for sure, COVID has changed many things, but one of the things it certainly has changed is that it has taken away the luxury for us to work in isolation. We have to collaborate together because there's absolutely no other chance. And I, 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 I feel that you know uh, necessity is the mother of all partnerships so <laughs> i think this is the this is the time where we have to partnership it's no more a choice uh, in terms of innovations let's really remain aspirational let's remain ambitious but let's not forget to remain grounded as well <laughs> akeem your final thoughts yes thank you barbara um let me perhaps offer, I mean, just to say one thing to Ted also, let me reassure you, um, I'm actually a bona fide son of agronomists and plant breeders. So, um, uh, you know, that has been part of my, my upbringing. But today as head of the UN's development program, that's what I try to bring to the discussion today is looking at the future of our food systems, not just in terms of the production, but really in terms of who is involved and who is able to access. And that's why I think the discussion is so critical because um, we are seeing a bifurcation in, in the agricultural economies. I mean, in many developing countries, three quarters of the labor force is still dependent on the, for livelihoods on agriculture. In Germany today, it is one in 100. So, you know, there is a, there is a pathway that can leave literally hundreds of millions of people without really a viable livelihood. So the way we shape an agricultural economy is critical. And I just offer one last remark on digital because I think it will, as we already heard from Sarah and, and others, um, and Hillary, your example as well, I think it will transform access to finance in a critical way. Um, we already see in the midst of COVID-19 with artificial intelligence, people being able to, and fintech, borrow and enter into a relationship with financial markets that was simply closed to them just a few years ago. They had no collateral, no credit record. Um, you know, today we see millions and millions of uh, small, medium scale enterprises that includes farmers, by the way. I mean, the private sector of farming begins with the farmer and then goes right up to, you know, international um, research or, or seed companies and so on. But I think for that small scale farmer, fintech is going to be critical in terms of access to finance. I think that's one way in which you can invest to move to the next level that we all talked about. But it also comes to I think a, a, a changing dynamic in producer and consumer. We invested with um, digital technology in Peru 
for a chocolate bar production that connects literally the buyer somewhere in the world with the producer and you can connect directly on the internet today in the way that you buy that bar of chocolate. But it can also be transparency. Um, where does a product come from? I think we are seeing a radically shifting marketplace. And Ted, yes, I think we will run into a number of these. Some of their science based, some of their driven by other issues. The freedom to choose the product you buy will also shape the agricultural economy, what we produce, how we produce it. And so digital, I think, is a very interesting and very transformative technology frontier, both at the small scale, but also at the large scale end of, of our farming economies. And one we you all need to watch carefully, hopefully with largely very positive benefits. So great to be with you today, Barbara, and um, thank you all for a fascinating panel. Thank you, Akim. Thank you so much. Howard, one quick minute. Great, thank you. And uh, it's really been an honor to join the panel. Uh, I'm, I'm guilty as a repeat attendee of the World Food Prize kind of year after year. So I'm, I'm glad to at least be here virtually. It's, uh, it's really, it's a pleasure. Uh, seed technology came up multiple times uh, in the course of this conversation. And uh, Jim, you mentioned this year's Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. And I think uh, kind of the, the award in technology uh, that uh, won the prize really embodies the type of innovation and collaboration that was discussed by this roundtable. And one of the prize winners specifically, I wanted to mention Jennifer Doudna. Uh, she sits on the scientific advisory board for a company that's called Inari Agriculture. And I wanted to just share this as an early success story because if you aren't familiar with Inari Ag, uh, but you are interested in what the next 10 to 20 years of seed technology looks like, I would suggest that you check them out. Uh, I think it's really worth, uh, worth the time. And so with that, Barbara, thank you again for having us. It's, uh, it's been just a, a real pleasure joining everyone else on this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Beth? Thanks very much. Um, I would just say that I, I know because I know a number of the panelists here um, from a few years back that you have a group of us assembled who have been in this for a long time, um, meaning that we've poured everything we have personally and professionally into, you know, upgrading and, and amplifying the food and agricultural um, story and, and the system. But we still have a marathon ahead of us, despite, I think, this, this optimism and, and uh, these, these opportunities that we see ahead of us. We may be getting ready for a sprint right at the moment, but the marathon still, still lies ahead. And um, one of the things that I think, you know, I would just again close on is that while COVID, to Pervy's point, is bringing us that opportunity to transform so many things, I also want to make sure that this group helps us publicly in delivering a message that we can't lose sight of the long-term game that is here ahead of us. Um, we see right now, whether it's with national governments, with politics, with just the way society is kind of culturally looking for instant gratification, that there's this interest very much and rightly so in the emergency humanitarian response tied to COVID. But we've all heard, and we use this phrase together, all of us, the building back better doesn't happen in a six month window. It doesn't happen with a small donation or a quick win to get some capital infusion into a particular area of need. This is, this is a long game. And so I hope that everybody who's on this panel um, sort of, you know, goes home feeling extra motivated, but stays in this um, because we've got a lot of opportunity ahead of us, but we still have um, a lot of work to do. Thank you, Beth. Ted? Your quick minute. To follow Beth is difficult. Well done, Beth, thanks. Uh, listen, um, you are, first of all, you're a humble person and your team is humble, but were it not for the World Food Prize and this fora, I'd rather be shaking your hand in person, but were it not for this fora, I would not have learned as much as I have just in this panel. And I'm fairly deep in this, so I intend to reach out to many of my panelists and others. So thank you, thank you. Very quickly. It's appropriate that we have this theme of finance and investment because my own experience tells me without it, no matter your type of production, you really can't produce. You have to have it no matter your technologies or not, et cetera. So, so I applaud that and I'm going to uh, double down on my learnings about that. I would still say though, that if that we have gotten where we've gotten, 
the records that the World Food Program can claim, even though hunger has risen through COVID, we have made great progress. Norm Barlog demonstrated that, that semi-dwarf wheat variety, which I have held in my hands when I was at Summit, are demonstrations of how we can achieve uh, uh, and address hunger over time. Marathon, Beth, you're absolutely right. Over the long term, we can. But innovation is what's got us there. Innovation at just about, not all, but just about every turn. And so not only should we be encouraging innovation through all these people who can provide finance and investments, small, medium, large companies, governments, foundations, micro loans, large loans, women's loans to you as well, we're not going to get there. And right now, I don't know if they've released the gap report, but I, if, if, it's, if the trend continues, uh, it will show that, the, the, that, that the, we're widening. We're not keeping up with what we have to produce by 2020. And largely it's because, well, there's food waste. And I'm so glad that there's a lot of people addressing food waste. Well, we should. But fixing food waste will not do it. We have got to innovate. And yes, that means a bit of risk. And so I hope that just as we're attentive to finance and investment, we take on and challenge those who simply choose to reject proven safe and technologies. Certainly I will be. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Ted. Sarah? Thanks. Um, well, it's just been an honor to be here with all of these uh, distinguished panelists. Um, I would just say the cost of investing in the changes that we need, the innovations, the uh, transformation of the food system is going to be far less than the cost of not in making those investments. And so when we're looking at, at the opportunities in front of us, the, the risks of, of, that, of those investments, we need to think about the cost of not making those changes and not investing and not really um, addressing hunger, addressing food security and nutrition security, um, addressing ecosystem damage and the loss of biodiversity. So I hope, uh, you know, we need to increase that investment. We need to do it in a more collaborative and coordinated way. And, and the risk of not doing it is something that we should all keep in mind. Thank you very much. Excellent challenge. Tony? Yeah, it's been a real honor to be on this panel. Um, I think the diversity of the panel demonstrates the types of partnerships which are needed going forwards um, to really get this right. Um, from an investment perspective, there is a huge opportunity um, that needs to be yielded. Um, I think that that needs to be supported by strong CEO level actions. And it's great to have CEOs on this call to demonstrate that they are behind this. Um, this must include accommodating for a, a just transition so that people are at the heart of this change. Uh, we are going into difficult times. We're already, of course, in them, but uh, we know this is going to be a difficult decade as we work together. Um, and ultimately, from the investment side, I think if we see that um, collaborative agenda that is co-created, that will help build trust amongst all stakeholders that everyone is aiming for the same target. And uh, I think Akeem, Akeem's background summarized very, summarizes very well uh, what those targets should be under the Sustainable Development Goals. So thanks again for having me. Thank you, Tony. Hillary, and then Ismail will give you the last word. Hillary? Thanks so much, Barbara. Um, yeah, I would just like to, to repeat that this is about long-term patient capital, going what Sarah, uh, what Sarah says, there is no alternative. Um, the people need the planet. The planet doesn't need people, if I can say it like that. If we're looking at uh, issues of climate change, if we're looking at issues of peace and stability, if we're looking about uh, counteracting migration, then we need to be investing in making sustainable jobs at home. And there is no country in the world which has developed without their agri-business and agri-sector developing. So we need to have patient capital 
our motto is clearly, if we start investing in women, we will get clear impact. At the producer level, her yields will get higher. If we want to deal with nutrition, it's through the mother. If we want to deal with child labor issues, which are upsetting some of our uh, members, the World Business Sustainability Council at the moment, it's through the mother. If we want to be investing locally, women are more sedentary. They stay and they invest where they are. So I think long, uh, long patient capital, if we want sustainable food supply systems um, and gender smart at every stage of the way. So starts linking our policy, our trade and breaking those silos between the gender issue and all of these other big issues. If we put them together, we'll actually find that a lot of the solutions are there in front of us by working through women. Thank you. Thank you. And to you, Ismail. Well, thank you. I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, what was said by Hillary. Uh, absolutely, the gender dimension is central, uh, not just for the food issues, but also for the, the entire sustainable development uh, uh, goals. But I would like to add something that was not said. Uh, 144 Nobel laureates have co-signed a letter to Greenpeace saying clearly, stop attacking biotechnology. It is 100% safe. In other words, what counts is the protein structure and the, and the DNA of the final plant. How it got there, whether it was by natural mutation, by conventional breeding, or by transgenetic uh, uh, transfer, doesn't make any difference. And that is supported by all the academies of the world. And when people tell me, but how do we know over the long haul? I say, well, the United States has had in its food system uh, GMOs for the last 15 to 20 years. And we haven't had a single case, a single case of food poisoning as a result uh, uh, of that. So the process itself is, is absolutely safe. What you do with it, which is true of almost any technology, uh, that's another story. But fundamentally, the process itself is absolutely safe. So let us go forward and use the new biology as a revolution, the new ICT as a revolution, and the new social awareness of specifically the role of women uh, as a, 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 a contribution. And all of that together is what will bring us uh, uh, the, the kind of resilience into the food and nutrition systems that the whole world counts on. And we will be able to do it in a way that is still compatible with and promotes sustainable development goals. And finally, thank you, Barbara, for leading all of this. Uh, you are magnificent and so is the team at the, at the World Food Prize. And actually, many of them are women. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all so much. What a tremendous group. And I know everybody just is so enriched by everything that you said. I want you to know your, your panel and all the panels are going to be available as recordings live right there in Hoover uh, shortly after this. So you can refer back to each other's comments and I hope you are able to connect. This has been uh, just a tremendous morning and launch to the 2020 International Borlaug Dialogue. It's not the same as uh, being all together. It's uh, hopefully an, uh, still an opportunity for making those connections, networking with, networking with each other and learning more and realizing, oh my gosh, the amount of progress and work that's going on is substantial. I want to invite everybody to uh, tune in to the upcoming side events. There's a whole series of them. Overseas Cooperative Development Council has a side event. Land Lakes has an innovative program there offering more discussion on Venture 37, uh, the Equal Exchange and National Cooperation, Cooperative Business Association is also there, and a side event by Corteva AgriScience. I think Jim was referring to some of it. So join for the rest of the afternoon or evening for this series of side events. And we start early tomorrow with even more side events. You can find them all at www.worldfoodprize.org forward slash side events. And tomorrow, tune in at nine o'clock central time as we offer the fabulous Borlaug Field Award ceremony pre-recorded. She's a fabulous, oh, I did reveal it there. 
fabulous awardee. Uh, tune in, enjoy it. Uh, there will be uh, some discussion uh, with one of our Council of Advisor members and uh, just continue to enjoy the, the dialogue for the rest of the day, the side events, post on social media, and look this afternoon for our daily digest. Every day, every one of our main stage days, where our media partners, Farming First, will be posting their daily digest. So thanks for tuning in and look forward to your next side events and let us know how it's going. Bye. <laughs>